In this video, we're going to talk about how we can sketch the root locus, and we're going to talk about some important rules. And then in the next video, we're going to look at an example of how we can actually apply those rules. So as I've mentioned previously, in theory, we could take our criteria from equations three and four, so those were for our gain and angle of our open loop transfer function, and we could check every relevant point in the S-plane and figure out which points are on the root locus and which points aren't. Obviously, that's very impractical. It's, it's just not worth our, our time and effort. So instead, what's been done is these requirements have been used to generate five rules that allow us to quickly sketch the root locus with doing minimal calculations. And so one thing I should note here is that the rules are going to be for a negative feedback system. And so we're gonna come back later and we're gonna see how these rules are adjusted. Some of them are the same, but some are adjusted a little bit for a positive feedback system. Okay, but right now we're looking at negative feedback system. So let's go ahead and get into these five rules. So our first rule is going to be that the number of branches is equal to the number of closed loop poles of the system. So the number of branches of the root locus is equal to the number of closed loop poles. And so in this case, I'm just defining a branch as the path that one pole traverses. And so we kind of saw that in a previous example where we sort of tracked our pole location as we changed the gain. So in that case, we had two branches um, because it was a second order system and we had two poles of our closed loop transfer function. So again, sort of key things here is that our number of branches is equal to the number of our closed loop poles. And again, our notation is very important. So we're talking about closed loop in that item one. Our second rule is a relatively simple one. And it just states that the root locus has to be symmetrical about the real axis. So the root locus is symmetrical about the real axis. Okay, so pretty straightforward that one. Uh, the second one is a little more involved and we've got a lot of terminology to unpack here. So our third rule is that on the real axis for a gain greater than zero, the root locus, and we're gonna sort of define where it can exist on the real axis here. So our root locus exists to the left of an odd number of something, so an odd an odd number of real axis finite open loop poles and or finite open loop zeros. So as I said, sort of a lot to unpack in this expression. Okay, so what we're saying is, if we're looking at the real axis in our complex S-plane, where on that real axis can our root locus be? So we're saying it has to be the to the left of an odd number of real axis. So we're talking about things that are on the real axis. And so what is it that's on the real axis? Finite open loop poles. So we're talking about now our open loop transfer function. So no longer our closed loop transfer function and or finite open loop zeros. So again, open loop. And so we can see it can be either poles or zeros. In both cases though, it has to be finite. And so this isn't something we've talked about before and we'll talk about that when we look at our next point or our next rule, rule number four. So let's sort of talk a little bit more about this point three first. 
And so as I'm writing this, I'll just remind you that we're gonna look at an example and I think everything is just going to, to be a bit more clear when we see an example. So we have our angle of g of s, h of s. So when we looked at the general expression, what that was, was that was the sum of the angles for our zeros minus the sum of the angles for our poles. Okay, so with that in mind, let's consider some point of interest on the real axis. So let's consider a point of interest and let's call that point Y1 and that point is on the real axis. So let's draw our real axis here. So we can say we have something that looks like this. And so this is our sigma. So here's our point of interest, y1. And so let's say we have several poles and zeros. So let's say we have a pole p1 here. Let's say we have a zero z1 here and we have a pole P2 here. And then let's add a couple complex ones. So let's say maybe we have a complex pair of zeros, Z2 and Z3. And so those are complex conjugate pairs. So what we can do is we can sort of step through this expression up here and we consider our angle, our angular contribution from each of the zeros, sum those, and then our angular contribution from each of the poles, sum those, and then we need to keep in mind from our previous video, we said that this angle has to be some odd multiple of 180. So odd multiple of 180 degrees in order for it to be on the root locus. So if we first consider our point two, so by consider, I mean, we're gonna draw sort of a line from P2 to Y1. So we get something that looks like that. And we see that our angle from the positive uh, real axis to that line is going to be zero degrees. So let's come down here and we can say P2. And the same thing is gonna be true for our Z1. So if I were to draw a line from Z1 to Y1, again, that angle from positive sigma, if we're trying to go up from positive sigma to that line is just going to be zero degrees. So we can say our P1, or sorry, P2 rather, not P1, so our P2 and our Z1 have a zero degree contribution at Y1. Okay, so our contribution from those complex zero Z1 and Z2. So in this case, we could again draw lines from Z2 to Y1 and Z3 to Y1. And so in this case, and this is always going to be the case with complex conjugates, is that our angular contributions are going to cancel out. So angle contributions from Z2 and Z3 cancel out. And so because these complex conjugates are always going to cancel out, that's why in rule three, we're only looking at real axis poles and zeros. Okay, so coming back down here now, we can look at P1. So if we draw a line from P1 to Y1, so we have something that looks like this. And so in this case, if we, if we sort of try to determine our angle from the positive sigma axis to here, we see that that's going to be 180 degrees. So coming back down here then, we can say that our angle from P1 is going to give 180 degrees, so not equal to, but let's just say it results in a 180 degrees. And so what that means then is if we consider all of these, we have zero. So come back up here to our formal equation, we would have zero from Z1, we would have some number from Z2, which is canceled out by Z3, so all of that's zero. And then in our poles, we have minus zero, and minus 180, so we have some odd multiple of 180, so our, our angle criteria is satisfied. And so I won't go into it, but we can see basically if we had another pole there um, to the right of that, then we would, depending on the location, we would potentially not be satisfying that if we had minus 180, minus 180, for instance, 
because then that sum is 360 or negative 360 and we're no longer at an odd multiple of 180. So in this case, what we can see is that this point Y1 is to the left of only one pole or zero on the real axis. And because of that, it can exist on the root locus. We'll come back and we'll see a little bit more about that in when we look at that example. So our fourth rule is that our root, where our root locus starts and ends. So our root locus is going to begin at poles, but we're gonna be a little more general than that. So our root locus begins at the finite and infinite poles. So these are going to be specific poles, open loop poles of g of s, h of s, and it's going to end, let's write that a little clear, so and it ends at the finite and infinite open loop zeros. So open loop, finite open loop zeros of G of S, H of S. And again, there's sort of a lot to unpack here, but once we see it in action, you're gonna see it's not too complicated. The main thing though is to say we're beginning at our poles. Uh, the poles of what? Well, they're the poles of the open loop system, which is G of S, H of S. And we're considering both finite and infinite poles. And we'll talk about that more here just in a second. Excuse me. And then we see that the root locus is ending on zeros. Again, at zeros of the open loop transfer function, g times h. And again, we're considering finite and infinite zeros. So let's talk about our finite and infinite uh, zeros and poles for a second. So if our function is approaching infinity, so if function, so let's move this down. So this isn't necessarily part of rule four. This is sort of just an aside about our finite and infinite poles. So if the function approaches infinity as our S is going to infinity, then we say we have a pole at infinity. So then the function has a pole at infinity. So similarly, we can say if our function is going to zero as s goes to infinity, then it's going to have an infinite zero. So if the function approaches zero as s goes to infinity, then the function has a zero at infinity. And so one thing to keep in mind is that, well, let's go ahead and look at this example first. So sort of a simple example function would be, let's say we have some g, which is k over s cubed. And so we could write this as k over s times s times s. And so if we look at this, we can see obviously we have three poles, right? So from the denominator, we can say we, say we have three poles all at zero. So now as our s is going to infinity, we notice that our function is going to zero. So as s goes to infinity, our function goes to zero. And because we have three s's in the denominator, we're going to have three zeros at infinity. And sort of a little note then is that every function is going to have an equal number of poles and zeros if we include the infinite poles and zeros. So every function of S has an equal number of poles and zeros So if the infinite poles and infinite zeros, so infinite 
poles and infinite zeros are included. And so that can be sort of a quick way to check. So if we come back to this function here and we say, well, we know we have three poles that are at zero. I don't see any explicit zeros in the numerator, but we know that we have to have an equal number of zeros in poles. Therefore, we have three zeros at infinity. So our fifth and final rule is sort of how do we deal with these infinite poles and infinite zeros? So let's see how we do that. So for infinite, and so this is going to relate back to four because if we have infinite poles and infinite zeros, where are we gonna start? How are we gonna end? Uh, and so we're gonna address that here with our step five or our rule five. So for infinite poles and zeros, the root locus is going to have some asymptote. So the root locus approaches straight line approximations, straight lines as asymptotes as the locus approaches infinity. And so we need to have equations for these asymptotes then. So our equations for our asymptotes are given by two things. We need to know where it intercepts the axis, and we also need to know the angle relative to the axis. So the first thing is going to be our real axis intercept. And again, all of this will hopefully be more clear as we look at an example in the next video. And something else to keep in mind too is our rule five is only relevant if we have infinite zeros or infinite poles. If we don't, then we don't need to consider this rule. So our real axis intercept is given by sigma sub a, and that sigma sub a is going to be equal to, in the numerator, the sum of our finite poles minus the sum of our finite zeros. In the denominator, we have the number of finite poles minus the number of finite zeros. Okay, so that's an important equation. And then the second thing we said is we need to know the angle from the real axis. So angle from our real axis, and important to note that this angle is going to be in radians. And so that is given by theta sub a, and our theta sub a is going to be equal to, in the numerator, we have two k plus one times pi, and in the denominator, we have the same thing from before, we have our number of finite poles minus the number of finite zeros. Okay, so, and then we need to specify that this k, this sort of count variable is going to be zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, so on and so forth. And so it's important to note that k is not the same as our gain value, which we might see in our g of s or our open loop transfer function. So again, sort of a really long video going over these rules, but I think everything will make sense as we look at an example in the next video.